some years ago, our children arrived on Christmas Eve, ready to celebrate the holiday. We had supper and happened to glance out into the yard to see a big deer eating out of the bird feeder. Our grandson's eyes got as big as saucers as he was sure this was one of Santa's reindeer having a good supper before having to leave and help pull the sleigh to deliver presents. That is still a highlight in the family. But join me for the rest of the story on Prairie Yard and Garden. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided by Heartland Motor Company, providing service to Minnesota and the Dakotas for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA, pioneers in bringing state-of-the-art technology to our rural communities. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. And by friends of Prairie Yard and Garden, a community of supporters like you who engage in the long term growth of the series. To become a friend of Prairie Yard and Garden, visit pioneer.org forward slash PYG. often have deer visit our yard even though we live right in town. In the winter we see lots of tracks in the snow and we had one doe that was an expert at tipping the bird feeder to spill the seeds so she could have a tasty meal. We really don't mind sharing the bird seed and quite often we will have a hosta that becomes a tasty meal to the deer. However, when they started to pluck my tomatoes it was time to get advice from John Logering, who deals with problem critters. Welcome, John. Thanks, Mary. It's lovely to be here, and I share, I share your sentiment about tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your background. Well, sure. I, I, uh, I'm a wildlife ecologist and have worked here at the University of Minnesota for about 20 years. Uh, I, I grew up in the Red River Valley and have enjoyed a lot of the things Red River Valley has to offer. Uh, but then I you know, pursued my education. I was in for a few years in Virginia uh, at Virginia Tech and, and then at Oregon State for several years. And uh, my principal areas of research is actually forest birds uh, at this point. Um, but I've always, since my time at Oregon State, I've been doing some uh, uh, vertebrate pest control sort of work. And that's, that's kind of how we've come to, to know each other. Well, that's what I was going to ask. How did you get started with being a, kind of an expert in critters? Well. I'm a pretty broad ecologist, so I, I know a little bit about mammals, a little bit about birds. You know, uh, today most university faculty are pretty focused on one thing, whereas I'm a little bit different and I focus on a lot of different things. Well, let's start with the little ones. How about mice? Are there different kinds of mice? And there are a couple of species of mice. They got, just like Mickey, they got big ears and, and a big long tail. And these are just two examples of the same species. Um, there are a couple of species, they look like this. So mice, are, they're climbers, they like to invade buildings, uh, they also live outside um, in forests and in pretty much anywhere, they, they, they live anywhere. Uh, so this is uh, uh, deer mice, uh, white-footed mouse uh, are common names for, for these creatures. Um, there are also house mice, and I only have a, I have a terrible, one terrible span, sample of this and it, it's not much, but you can see it's got big ears just like, uh, just like the other mice did. House mice are commensal, they live with people, and then we have something most folks call field mice, which aren't really mice. They're voles. That's with a V, V-O-L-E. And voles, I brought two examples here because one's kind of chubby. Uh, you know, that's what they get like when they're really old. And then uh, the younger ones, of course, are a little thinner. But voles, let's see if I can hold it still. Voles, unlike mice, have, have pretty small ears. They're barely longer than the fur. And a, a fairly short tail, maybe twice the size, twice the length of their, their feet. And so voles, uh, 
are in usually grassy areas, more grassy areas, and they tend not to be climbers. So if you find a small little rodent in your garage, it could be either a vole or a mouse. But if he's inside the house, he's almost always a mouse because it, he had to climb to get into the house. For the most part, the mice eat about the same thing. They just live in different environments. You know, again, voles more of a grassland environment, mice more of a, well, almost anywhere, but typically more forest. Which ones tend to chew the bark off of our trees? So almost any small rodent will chew the bark off of the tree, and, and typically that happens in wintertime. You know, most folks report this. They mostly report it in March and April when they get out to see the damage, but when it happens is usually during winter. And if you were living in the middle of winter outside in Minnesota, pretty much anything that tasted good and had calories would look pretty darn fine. So there are animals that don't climb, so it happens usually under the snow, or they use the snow kind of as a scaffold and they work their way up and can chew essentially as high as the snow gets. And of course, if it's a thin barked tree, all the better because you don't have to chew your way through the protective layers. You can get to the cambium, you can get to that the, the sap uh, very readily. So uh, maples, fruit trees, you know, all good examples of something that are vulnerable. Um, as well as some pine trees, things like arborvitae and such are, are highly vulnerable um, and that's not, probably because the sap tastes good, but because it has high calories, all the, all the, the, the resins and such have, uh, have burnable calories. And, and that's, you know, that's what they're looking for. They're, they're just looking to survive the winter. Is there anything that you can do or, uh, to protect the trees from these little fellows in the winter? Yeah, that's really hard uh, because damage often occurs uh, at a time of year when we're not regularly going out and inspecting our landscapes. Um, so knowing that you have a vole population ahead of time would be handy. Um, to, to protect the tree itself, about the only thing you can do is apply some sort of a hardware cloth cylinder, something that's protective. Um, and the reason I say that, I mean, you can buy sprays to put on them, they're repellents, um, and repellents have a, a variety of effectiveness. Um, if, if you really love that tree, I wouldn't use a repellent. I'd, I'd go with the physical, I'd, I'd go with the encapsulating or you know, putting a, a cylinder of hardware cloth around it with a small opening because these critters, and, and now, now it's gonna get a little, it's gonna get a little macabre, uh, because again, from the Wildlife Museum, I brought, I brought a, a skull, and you can see how small that skull is. Um, you know, a, a dime is about all the diameter that it would need to slide through uh, a welded wire, woven wire cloth, you know, or a hardware cloth. So you have to have a pretty small grid size to protect that tree from voles. If it's a rabbit, well, then any old grid size will do. Um, you could also be mindful of mulching your trees. Right? If you're a small mammal in Minnesota in February, you'd love to have the base of the thing you like to eat to have six inches of fresh mulch so that it's a great place to live. You've got all that insulation. You can burrow down in that and make a lovely home and be able to you know, wait out those February storms. So, uh, I always caution folks, if you have a vole problem or a debarking problem, look at your mulch as well, because you, you might wanna maybe hold off on a really thick mulch in the fall, because that's just providing great habitat for, at least for these guys, the voles. We have three ground squirrels that are pretty typical in Minnesota. Um, the Richardson's is on, the, on this side here, uh, the Franklin's in the middle, and then the 13 line ground squirrel uh, is, is, or the stripy gopher, that most people think of when they when the gophers. Um, these two, do not have much of a concern for homeowners. Most people don't have Richardson's or Franklin's ground squirrels in their landscape, but the, the striped gopher, or the 13 line ground squirrel, he's everywhere. And they're prolific, and they make lots of tunnels, and if you're in the right environment, uh, I, I hear lots of complaints about uh, stripey gophers. And, and I am prohibited from recommending anything but love for stripey gophers, because of course it is the University of Minnesota's mascot. So I, I can only tell you to love them and to be happy that you have a, our mascot living in your property. <laughs> we also have pocket gophers. Right? So all of the other gophers, the ground squirrels, I should say, uh, they make holes in the ground and they don't make much of, a, much of a pile of dirt, if you will. But pocket gophers are the ones that most people, when they think of a gopher, and they think of that big mound, that five gallon bucket full of dirt that's, that's uh, dumped on the ground, and that's a pocket gopher. And we have pretty much just one species of, of pocket gopher um, here in Minnesota. 
um, and they're called pocket gophers because if you roll them over, you can see that, that right here, uh, right next to their mouth, they have little pockets in, of, of skin, and that's a pocket where they put their groceries uh, as they're foraging, and then they carry them down to their burrow and, and uh, carry them to the brood level or to the, to the living chambers, essentially. And um, that pocket is so deep, it goes all the way back to the shoulder. And that's how they, they sort of essentially carry the groceries uh, back to their young, uh, and, and as well as put them in a place to store them for winter. The root crops are what pocket gophers love. Uh, you know, a, a carrot, uh, a, certainly a potato. Um, you know, their natural food out in a, you know, out in a prairie system would be um, those big, thick roots um, from, from the forbs that are out in a, in a prairie system. Not, you know, grasses don't have a, a big, thick tap root, uh, but the forbs do, and that's what, they'd be, that's what they would be targeting. If you have a problem with these guys, how do you catch them or how do you, do, how do you discourage them from tearing up your whole garden? You, you know, my, I've, always, I've always said that it's a, it's a four-step program for pest, vertebrate pest management uh, here in Minnesota. Uh, the, the first thing is, can you change what you're doing to discourage the critter to be there? You know, if you can get them to just go someplace else, that solves your problem. Um, uh, the second one is repel them in some way, use a repellent. Exclude them is the third step. And then the fourth step, of course, is, uh, is, is, is direct management, you know, where you're capturing them, you're trapping them, you're, you're, you're doing something like that. Um, with pocket gophers, most people don't want to change their landscape. You know, a gardener who's got a beautiful, you know, well manicured landscape, they're not interested in doing that. Uh, they're not interested in planting things without big tap roots. So, so that's, that one's hard. Uh, you can't really exclude these guys because no one wants to bury a fence three or four feet down in the in the soil. Um, they don't repellents don't work, um, so it's about capturing them. And so, uh, uh, pocket gophers, the, the probably the easiest way to uh, to deal with them is in a, a sort of lethal sort of way. Uh, there there aren't many live traps available for pocket gophers. They do exist, but they're hard to to deal with. Um, so it's mostly uh, uh, kill trapping. Now we're coming up into fall and a lot of people want to plant tulips and bulb crops. Don't we have to worry about squirrels and maybe even gophers digging those up? Squirrels are a major, uh, they love those fall tulips. You know, going into winter, it's going to be cold. They're looking for extra calories and those tulip bulbs are big packages of energy. You know, compared to anything else in the landscape, they're, they're, they're twice, no, they're not twice, they're 10 times more energy Per, you know, per package than anything else. So yeah, squirrels are notorious for digging up tulip bulbs. Um, and, and the solution is really hard. There's no good solution other than to perhaps uh, lay a protective barrier, exclude them. Uh, chicken wire, it's just something to keep them from digging it up after you, after, you, after you plant them. The most vulnerable time is right after you plant them because the squirrels, right? Squirrels' natural behavior is to gather acorns, dig a little hole, put the acorns in the hole, and then, and then come back and, and, and collect them when they're hungry. So when you dig a tulip, you know, dig, a, dig a, a hole for a tulip, put a tulip in there, pack down some soil on top of it, you just mimicked what a squirrel naturally does. So when they see that, they think, hey, look, a big squirrel just planted a neat, nice little tidbit right there for me, and they dig it out. Squirrels and the bird feeder is probably my number one requests. They, folks who have bird feeders, you know, Minnesotans, you know, somewhere in the 30 to 40 percent of Minnesotans feed birds. It's fantastic. We are a bird-loving uh, state, uh, but there are downsides. Um, and I don't know if this is a downside, frankly. You know, my, uh, my father loves the squirrels that come to his bird feeder. In fact, when his bird feeder's empty, he says the squirrels, and I, I haven't verified this, but he says the squirrels come up to the window and put their hands over the window looking in, trying to remind him that he needs to fill the bird feeder. So uh, from my perspective, or from the wildlife ecologist's perspective, you know, think about bird seed. It's a huge package of food, more calories than you could ever get eating nuts and seeds and grass seeds and you know all the things that squirrels are normally eating so of course they're going to think about how to get into the bird feeder in fact they're thinking about it from the time they wake up until the time they go to bed every single day so if you're spending an hour a week trying to outwit, outwit a squirrel you're going to lose the squirrel's going to be smarter than you are well not really smarter but more persistent and they're natural problem solvers so you you have to outwit them by trickery so things you can do for squirrels, number one, if you have some extra cayenne pepper around, sprinkle it in with the seed. It turns out cayenne pepper, uh, mammals have receptors to taste it. Birds do not. So the birds won't care. 
and the squirrels, you know, the, it might be a little too spicy for them. Think about putting your bird feeder in a place that the squirrel can't access it. So sometimes this involves either uh, hanging it from a wire, and if you can do that, uh, two wires is better than one. If you just hang it from one wire, then you get fireman squirrels, right? They just, they just crawl up on the tree or whatever, and they slide down, and, down the pole, and they and fe feast on the, uh, on, the, on the bird feeder. But a squirrel can run on a wire just fine. We've all seen them run the high, high line wires. So look for an old hose. Take a chunk of old hose, three or four feet long, and then thread the wire that you hang the bird feeder through. Just, just thread that hose, that old hose, on the wire. So the squirrel comes running along on that wire, he hits the hose section, and whoop, he flips on his back and falls off. So simple, easy thing to do, cheap, inexpensive, uh, and great entertainment. Um, you also can get uh, cones that you can put on you know, poles, and those are pretty good, but you'd be amazed at how far a squirrel can jump, and they know exactly how far they can jump. And sometimes they'll even figure out how to jump you know, up onto the tree and then run the high line wire and then over to another tree and finally figure out a way to jump to the, the, the shepherd's crook where you have your bird feeder. So they'll outwit you if you give them a chance. You know, and then there's also the option of just put uh, maybe a, a nail a cob of corn to the, to the fence in the back of the yard. Move them away from your bird feeder. Uh, give them an alternative problem to solve and uh, they'll spend all their time there and you'll get to enjoy the birds. Wow, that's a good idea. Now, how about rabbits? You know, rabbits are a wonderful uh, component, I think, of our backyards because they're so much fun to watch, but uh, they're really the bane to much gar many gardeners. Rabbits are uh, a little bit tough um, in the sense that they're, uh, they're a general uh, herbivore. They run around, so they, 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 I have a rabbit skull here, and you can see they have two uh, uh, front incisors. So one of the things we use to identify rabbit damage is uh, the, the shoots that are nibbled off or what have you are cleanly clipped, just like you used your, you know, your best pruning shears. They just snipped it off, often at about a 45 degree angle. Um, so they'll snip off any vegetation and they'll eat just about anything, leafy greens, uh, uh, pretty much any, any, anything in your garden that you'd think about eating, rabbit would, find, uh, would be just fine with that. Trouble is you probably like the bottom part of the carrot but the rabbits will have no trouble eating the top part or the beans before it actually sets seed or many other things. Uh, you know, a row of beans that just pops up and have those two big cotyledons, you know, they just run right down the row and, and, and nibble them all off. So um, with rabbits, our management strategies are, are uh, several fold. Um, you know, the first thing, is there anything I can do to change my habitat? Well, try to make your landscape less cluttered. Right? A rabbit is a very soft, yummy thing to eat, so when it comes time to give birth, they look for a secure place. Now, in, the, in our landscapes, our manicured landscapes, sometimes that's an over-mulched garden bed that maybe has shrubs that have low branches that provide that really secure place for a rabbit to have babies. So if you have those areas in your landscape, maybe think about tightening them up, cleaning them up, making less, less structure for a rabbit to hide in. Um, and that makes your yard less hospitable so the rabbits move elsewhere. Um, and then as far as managing the rabbits you have, uh, repellents work pretty well on rabbits and there are a whole host of repellents that are based on olfactory or smell based as well as taste based, uh, hot, pe hot pepper sauce sort of based. Um, the key with repellents is try one, buy the smallest bottle you can, try one, see if it works. If it doesn't work, Try another repellent. Don't give up right away because some repellents work and some repellents don't uh, for your particular circumstance. And, and not all repellents work in every circumstance. So give it a try. And then, of course, if you have a garden, uh, the beauty about rabbits is they hop but don't jump. A two foot fence is all you need to keep rabbits out of your garden uh, because they don't jump over things, uh, they hop along. Um, so, so a simple two foot fence that you could easily step over keeps all the rabbits out. I have a question. What would you recommend for a crab apple tree that looks good all summer? You know, that's a great question because everybody thinks of the flowering crab apples for the beautiful flowers in the spring, but they can last maybe a week or 10 days maximum, but the plants in your yard year round. So I'm standing next to a Donald Wyman crab, a flowering crab, it has these beautiful cherry red fruits that'll hang on all winter. This is both a really beautiful winter landscape feature, especially when a little snow is on the trees, adds color to the landscape, but they also they provide food for migrating flocks of cedar waxwings and pine grosbeaks during the winter time. And then when the robins come back in the spring, 
spring, they'll usually clean up the rest of the fruit. This tree is also disease resistant. It gets a little bit of apple scab, but not nearly like some of the cultivars that lose all their leaves in midsummer. And so it creates its both the beautiful flowers, attractive foliage all summer, and then that beautiful fruit during the winter and early spring. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chaska, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. And John, what about deer in the yards? Deer in the yards are a real challenge. Uh, they're not coming for the grass, they're coming for your hostas, right? And, and, and other delicious, delicious uh, horticultural products. Um, certainly, there are resistant varieties that you could plant, um, but, but let's face it, horticulturalists don't get into the game just to limit their palate to a very narrow piece of the opportunities, right, of the possibilities. So, you know, with deer, you have to be a little more uh, uh, proactive and, and, and anticipate them coming. Uh, first of all, deer damage is different from all the other critters we've been talking about, right? All the other critters, rodents and rabbits and such, they have an incisor on the top and the bottom, so when they when they snip something off, it's like a pair of a nice uh, garden shears. Deer, and I brought, sorry, I've got a, I'm gonna go a little Halloween on you here. I've got a skull from a, 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 a female deer. And you can see that she's got lower incisors, but, but th there's nothing on the top. She has no teeth on the top of her, of her, uh, of her, of her mouth. So when, so, so when a female deer, or when any deer uh, forages, they grab and rip. And that's how you can look. You can look at the damage and notice that it looks like it's a torn damage on, a, on that twig or the hosta or what have you. It doesn't look cleanly clipped. If it's cleanly clipped, you got a rabbit problem. If it's torn, you got a deer problem. So what to do? There are lots of options for, for home sort of gardeners. You certainly can exclude them. You can put up a fence, right? And there are a lot of plans online that you can get that use electric fences or, or, or barrier fences. If it's a small space, Deer won't jump over a short fence to get into the garden. Doesn't matter what's in there. We, we, we put, as biologists, we've done some studies, and you can put uh, apples and grain in the middle of winter in that area and the deer won't jump in because if they can't see a way to run and jump out, they won't jump in. So short fence works for small spaces. Now as you get bigger and bigger spaces, you need a taller and taller fence. So if you want to protect three acres, you know, you're talking about a 10 foot fence. Um, but a small acre, a small acreage, 20 by 20 feet, simple five foot fence is, is, uh, will, su will suffice. They've done studies with 16 foot cattle panels, so it was actually a 16 by 16 foot space and they didn't have any deer that would go over the top. Um, if you want to make it maybe longer and then put a cattle panel every 16 feet or something, you know, something like that so that, and maybe put up some visual things to remind the deer that, hey, this, there's a barrier. Now it makes it a little harder to garden, admittedly, but, but it will keep the deer out and it's you know, a fairly short fence and, and doesn't take a lot to set up. Uh, so that's a physical way. You can also use electric fence if you have the ability to uh, have or, or you purchase an electric fencer. Um, there's a fun technique of taking a little peanut butter over a three by four inch square of aluminum foil, bend it over the wire, and then the, the scent attracts the deer and then they get popped in the middle of the night uh, with the electricity as they're sniffing the aluminum foil with the peanut butter. So it, it tends to discourage them. Um, and of course, if they touch the fence, it'll, it'll zap them as well. How about repellents? There are uh, some repellents that work with deer and there are a whole host of sort of home remedies, if you will, right? The, the purpose of repellents are to make the deer think, whoa, this environment is something weird. It's something I'm not familiar with. It makes me uncomfortable. So I'm gonna go over to the neighbors. The trouble with repellents is it depends on when you apply them, how much rain you've had, the time since the last rain, um, has the deer experienced this repellent before? So if, if, if your repellent that you're using is something that they've experienced before, they'll, they, they'll, they'll act like they, you know, you know, they don't have any trouble with it, you know. Do you sometimes recommend alternating your repellents just so they don't get used to one? Absolutely. I mean, you always want to mix up repellents. Never buy the 55 gallon drum of the repellent because that's too much and you'll never, they'll get used to it. Okay, well, let's just touch on a couple of other critters like a woodchuck and a skunk or a possum. So, skunks are out there doing damage. They often do this damage in August uh, where they're, you know, they dig little blind little tunnels and uh, they're looking for lawn, you know, uh, grubs and insects, various insects in the, in the turf. 
um, and uh, you might have a whole family of skunks, right? So, so there's a lot of mouths all running around together that are digging these holes. You know, they're out at night, most people just see the damage, they don't know what it is, probably skunks. Hard to manage skunks. Um, you got to realize that skunks, you know, they, they own the place. They walk around in the middle of the night, you know, they're, 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 they're packing the best weapon nature has. They're not afraid of anybody. Uh, uh, and they should only be afraid of one thing. And this is where I love to promote great horned owls, right? Because a great horned owl is the only thing a skunk really is, it really lives in fear of. Because of course, owls are out at night, they're quiet, and they have no sense of smell. So they don't care about the bazooka that that skunk is carrying to, to ward off any, any potential uh, predators. They just swoop in and have, have, a, have them for a meal. Woodchucks are tough. They're really just a big, fat, chubby squirrel, right? They're related to squirrels, so they will climb trees. It's the funniest thing you'll ever see. Woodchucks, usually the gardener thing is, is uh, that when they're burrowing underneath your, uh, your garden shed or, what, or your wood pile or what have you. They will cause landscape damage. Um, they're tough to manage because they, they're, you know, they're, there's not really a toxicant available. There's no repellents that really work. Um, usually we manage them by excluding them from garden, under the garden shed or the wood pile or what have you. Um, and then occasionally, this is one of the species where uh, some of those gas cartridges actually are a lethal form of control. Of course, not near buildings that humans are ha habitating, but it, it's about the only thing I even mention gas cartridges for. Well, in this past year, we had an opossum by the greenhouse for the first time. Are they good or bad? They're an omnivore. They eat anything and everything. So, so for some gardeners, they might get in and disrupt their plants, but odds are they're probably eating insect pests and things you don't want. They're also fantastic for eating ticks. Um, and this is a, an odd, odd connection, but possums are very uh, fastidious. They like to keep themselves very clean and they groom themselves very much. So, you know, it's this big shaggy dust mop that walks through the forest or what have you, and it picks up every deer tick and, and wood tick in the, in the environment, and then they clean themselves. And so I, I can't remember, frankly, I can't remember what the estimates are, but, but thousands of ticks, they eat thousands of ticks because they're, they're always grooming and, and cleaning themselves off and they're at, right at the right height to pick them all up. So, so I would like to say possums are, Okay, they're darn ugly, but but they're you know their face only their mother maybe could love, but uh, but I like them. I like to have more possums in the environment. John, this has been so interesting, and you have given us such wonderful information. Thank you so much. It's really been my pleasure. Thanks for coming. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided by. Heartland Motor Company, providing service to Minnesota and the Dakotas for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA, pioneers in bringing state-of-the-art technology to our rural communities. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. And by friends of Prairie Yard and Garden, a community of supporters like you who engage in the long-term growth of the series. To become a friend of Prairie Yard and Garden, visit pioneer.org forward slash PYG.